Good morning and welcome to WGN TV Political Report. I'm Paul Lisnick. Last week marked one year in office for President Joe Biden and his administration still facing an uphill battle on several fronts. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to rage across the U.S. A slow supply chain and concerns over inflation are growing. Still, President Biden sees his first 12 months in office as a success. I didn't overpromise, but I think if you take a look at what we've been able to do, uh, you'd have to acknowledge we made enormous progress. But one of the things that I think is something that uh, one thing I haven't been able to do so far is get my Republican friends to get in the game of making things better in this country. We knew all along that a lot of this was going to be an uphill fight. And one of the ways to do this is to make sure we make the contrast as clear as we can. While Biden's Build Back Better plan has stalled on Capitol Hill, the administration was able to push through a massive trillion dollar infrastructure plan with bipartisan support. Well, I spoke with Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg about that and much more. Mr. Secretary, good morning. Thanks for being with me. During the first year on the job, you helped get the infrastructure package through. Um, we got word on Friday that Illinois is going to get about $1.5 billion for updating bridges alone. Look, our state has more than 2,000 bridges that need major repairs. So what now? Who decides what bridges and how soon does this start? Well, the dollars are now loaded up and ready to go. Uh, one thing that's important to note is uh, we work closely with the state of Illinois and with local partners in actually delivering these bridge improvements. Uh, so uh, our role really is to make the funding available and to do some quality control. Uh, then it's it's over to the state to, to set up that plan and, and make the list. And we know among the 2,300 plus bridges across the state of Illinois that need work, that even with this enormous level of funding, there's going to have to be a lot of prioritization. Uh, and one thing that we're uh, working on in particular is uh, changing some of the ways that we move this funding to make it easier for local governments to work with us. That means reducing the local share that's required, sometimes uh, even covering 100% of the cost of bridges so that that doesn't get in the way, whether we're talking about you know some of the major bridges in, in a place like Chicago that, that carry an enormous enormous amount of traffic, or a rural bridge in a rural county in Illinois that may not be as famous or as well known, but when it goes out, that means a half hour detour or reroute for everybody in that community, and it's extremely important to them. Uh, from, from the biggest to the smallest, we want to make sure we're supporting those bridges that, that Americans count on for getting themselves and for getting goods where they need to be. Supply chain issues, they've improved over the last period of months, but there's still frustration among consumers. What are the next steps to help continue to alleviate the problems? Yeah, so the good news is that uh, our supply chains, our ports have been moving more goods than ever before in American history. The challenge is the demand is even greater than that. Plus, you have staffing shortages, things related to the Omicron variant, and a lot of reminders that as long as the pandemic continues, there will be pandemic-related issues in our supply and our supply chains. There's things we can do about it in the near term and the long term. Near term, we're working with the private sector, making sure that we tear down barriers, uh, clear out red tape, and connect all of the dots that we can. You know, these are, these are mostly privately owned, as they should be, but we have a role helping. For the long run, it's about public infrastructure. Those private supply chains operate on uh, railways, on roads, on uh, ac across ports, and a lot of other resources, many of which are either regulated or owned and operated by government entities. That's where we got to make sure that we're providing the funding to fix them and keep them in great shape. And that's why the president's bipartisan infrastructure law is so important, whether it's the bridge announcement we're talking about right now or the work we're going to do on ports or airports, rails, and roads. All of it fits together to give us a, a healthy supply supply chain that will be better able to withstand the next round of shocks, whatever it is, whether it's a health issue, a cybersecurity issue, a weather issue. We know that more resilient infrastructure means better supply chains. Just on a personal note, you know, on top of this life-changing year for you, uh, you and Chastin have adopted two, two twins, Penelope and Joseph. I'm just curious, how has life changed for you, your priorities, the way you view things? Uh, how has that impacted you? You know, it changes everything, as, as I think every new parent will say. And, uh, you know, friends try to tell you, and then you actually live it and you realize your, your, uh, your relationship to the future changes. And, uh, you know, you have a whole new sense of urgency. I used to care about the future because I was often the youngest person in the room. Uh, now I care about the future in a different way because I'm, I'm holding in my arms infants whose lives are going to be shaped and, and whose opportunities are going to be decided 
by whether we do right by them or whether we fail them, especially in this decade. I think the 2020s are a really consequential decade for what it's going to be like to be an American for as long as my children are going to be alive. And uh, it, it creates a, a whole new sense of propulsion in the day job, even while it's competing with the day job, uh, because, uh, of course, you, it's just uh, so much work, joyful work, but meaningful work. I have found that three in the morning when one of them needs a bottle is uh, also a pretty good time to catch up on emails and memos. So I'm slowly learning how to fit it all together. Yeah, but I'm sure Truman, Truman and Buddy also wanted you to walk them in the middle of the night, so I understand that. <laughs> uh, you, you've made a case this year that uh, a lot of the America's infrastructure decisions have been furthered by racial inequity, separated communities. So with all of that sort of already in place and the goals that you've been setting, is there a world where we undo the damage that's already ingrained in our communities? I think there is. It begins by making sure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past, that we get it right this time. But we also have to make sure that we deal with some of these scars that we have inherited from decisions that were made at a time when transportation was sometimes used almost as a weapon, uh, when it was dividing as well as connecting. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have funds for reconnecting communities that were cut up by the way the, the, that a, a rail line or a highway was placed. And when we do it right, then, then we're building racial and economic justice and, by the way, we have a huge chance to build generational wealth because the opportunities, the, the, the business opportunities that are coming, the job opportunities for workers, most of which, by the way, won't require a college degree uh, alongside the, the engineering jobs and the architecture jobs. This is really a, a source of opportunity that can contribute, I think, uh, to much greater racial and economic equity in this country. Uh, Illinois has gone, uh, done a lot with regard to electric vehicle infrastructure, incentivizing drivers, manufacturers. Other states aren't moving as quickly. What's the plan with regard to electric vehicles? And noting that not everybody can afford one right now. Yeah, some states have moved further than others, and I've been very impressed by how Governor Pritzker and the administration in Illinois have been proactive. They haven't been waiting on Washington, although we're now doing a lot more at the federal level, too. A part of what we've proposed is to make electric vehicles more affordable so that uh, that, that initial price doesn't get in the way of families uh, owning one. Because when you own one, of course, uh, provided you can afford it, then you're saving money every single day because it's cheaper to power a car with electrons than it is with gas, uh, especially these days. Uh, so we, we know know that, that there is benefit. And by the way, uh, that's true in cities. Uh, it's also true in rural areas. Uh, you know, often it's rural drivers who actually drive the, the longest distances and stand to gain the most from, from these fuel savings in an electric pickup truck or car. We got to make it easier to own. We got to make it more affordable to own. And the biggest thing coming out of that infrastructure law is creating the charging stations, whether it's a, a neighborhood in, in Chicago where it's not profitable for a company to do it without an incentive, or uh, a, a rural area across southern Illinois where there's a long distance uh, that uh, that drivers really need to count on that that charging point in between where they started and where they're going. Uh, we can fund that national network and I'm teaming up with Secretary Granholm over at the Department of Energy to do just that. With just about 15 seconds, give me one goal you have for 2022 in your world. Well, look, the, the biggest thing we got to do is uh, uh, make sure that we're prepared for the future. And, and that means making more and more gains around safety, equity, technology, uh, and, and climate, uh, all of which are wrapped up in getting these dollars out uh, so that the projects can be on time, on task, and on budget. Mr. Secretary, thanks for your time this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Nice speaking with you.